Welcome to the True Talk Cafe podcast. And it's Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's Day, everybody. I hope your loved one or you've picked out a Valentine for yourself. I don't know. I did. (laughs) But thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited that you're here. Our podcast will tackle a myriad of topics ranging from relationships to personal development and everything in between. In the spirit of Black History Month, today's show is called Diversity of Blackness. We'll explore all shades of Blackness and how non-mainstream Blackness has been impacted by racism and discrimination. But before we dive in, let me introduce you to the pod crew. My name is Renee Stewart, and I'm joined by my co-host, Anna Garcia. Hey, Anna. Hi, everyone. And Lolly Ramirez Bennett. Hi, Lolly. Hello, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) And unfortunately, our other co-host, Carla DeCour, is not going to be able to join us today, but we are wishing her well, and she will be back with us on the next episode. Collectively, we span four generations. Can you believe that? We've all experienced ups and downs in our personal lives and professional careers that have qualified us to share our unique perspectives with you, and we're so excited to do so. Before we get into today's content, I wanted to let you know where you can find us on social media. On Instagram and Facebook, you can use at True Talk Cafe. And on Twitter, you can use at True Talk Cafe One. Don't forget to like us, rate us, and leave a review. We value your feedback. We want to ensure that we are providing content that resonates with you. So please, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on whatever platform you listen to your podcast. We are so excited about today's show. You will want to stay tuned to hear what our guest has to share about her identity and identifying in a world of Blackness. Also stick around to find out how you can join us on a live show. Now let's get started. February is Black History Month, which is officially recognized by governments in the U.S., Canada, and it's even observed in the Ireland and the U.K. It focuses our attention to the many contributions of Black people, as well as teaches us about noteworthy individuals who have helped shape and change our society. The past few years have been particularly historic, and as a result, there have been a major push for racial justice for people of color and marginalized populations. The 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist for the New York Times Magazine, has been a catalyst to change the narrative of the origins of the slave trade in America and how it shaped what the country would become. However, Latin America and the Caribbean received 95% of the Africans stolen during the transatlantic slave trade. But what does it mean to be a descendant of those Africans today? in a world where more voices are calling out racism in Latin America. As our conversation continues, we'll delve deeper into this topic and specifically address how Black Latinos have been impacted by racial injustice. To add to this conversation, we have invited an expert that is very familiar with this topic that will share her expertise and experience with us. Her name is Catherine White. Catherine has more than 20 years of experience in program management and leadership positions in the public sector. Prior to joining AT&T, Catherine served a 15-plus year tenure at both Lockheed Martin and the Northrop Grumman Corporation in various IT executive roles for tactical mission critical programs. Aside from her professional life, Catherine's pride and joy reside in her roots. Catherine is a first-generation American Washington, D.C. native, born to Dominican parents. Today, she and her African-American husband have twin teen daughters who are bilingual, biliterate, and bicultural. We love that. (laughs) Catherine is an advocate for underrepresented groups and has a passion for community service. Welcome, Catherine. We're so glad that you can join us today. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. All right, so let's get started. First off, Let's define the term Afro-Latinx, okay? So that term typically brings visibility to Latinos who are Black as descendants of the American diaspora. Many people believe that the two identities are mutually exclusive, when in reality, Latinx is an ethnic identity, while Black is a racial identity. So with that said, 
When you think about intersectionality, Catherine, within such a diverse culture, what are some of the challenges you have experienced identifying as Afro-Latino? I love that. I love this topic because I love hip hop and R&B just as much as I do merengue y bachata, right? So those intersectionalities, that's me all the way. I was that household where growing up on the weekends, we would have family over, push over the coffee table, roll up the carpet, and the living room became our dance floor, our cultural experiences, and we were going to school. But I mean, like, we were going to learn something today. And and so from those experiences also come many challenges, as you asked, right? So not being fully accepted by either group was very difficult, right? So whether it was growing up, example would be going on a field trip, right? Everybody pulls out their lunch, but my lunch looks different than my classmates' lunch, right? So there were little things like that. And even in the workplace, when we would have workplace gatherings, sometimes I didn't get the joke. I didn't get the joke because in my household, we were listening to Telemundo. We were watching novelas. We, it was a whole nother cultural experience that I did a world that I wasn't familiar with. And so also we would have experiences in church. When I married my husband, we started going to English church, right? So he would understand the mass and the flow of things. What I didn't realize is that all my life I had gone to Spanish mass And so all of my prayers and rituals, I only knew them in Spanish. And so there were these two worlds that I felt like I was a part of, but the outside world didn't necessarily accept me in that way, right? So I was consistently trying to prove myself. In fact, my children, even though they are are fully immersed in both cultures and, and can speak both languages, they're often asked, because they look Black, they're often asked to prove themselves, to speak Spanish. Oh, you're, you're Latino? Oh, okay, well, say something in Spanish. Or So it's, it's, it's very frustrating to consistently have to prove yourself and be questioned about your Blackness or about your Latino-ness. Oftentimes, I tell my husband, I said, the next time I'm questioned about my Blackness or how Black I am, I'm going to pull out my Black card. And so the joke in our house... <laughs> The, the joke in our house is my 23 and me <laughs> is my black card. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because after I actually did the DNA testing, I, I realized that I'm my percentage, I'm more African than anything else, right? And And so all of my life, even though both of my parents are Dominican and everyone, as far as I can trace back in my family tree is, is Latino, is from the island, is Dominican. And so when I did the DNA testing, I come to realize, you won't guess what percentage of my DNA is Dominican. 2%. 2%. Less than 10. <laughs> what was that, Anna? Okay, I got a 2%. No, Renee said less than 10. 10. And I, I, 10 yeah. There, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was less than 10. It was zero, nada, oh. zip, zilch. Oh, my goodness. So, Yes. And, and, and the reason being is because many mar- modern day Dominicans in our DNA, that trace back to the island, back to La Española, to the Dominican Republic doesn't exist because our natives, Taino tribe of the island, once the colonists appeared on the island and, and took charge, our, our ancestors were basically extinct. They were either worked to death or the Europeans brought diseases, the Europeans executed others. And so that lineage, there are very few of us that exist today that can actually be traced by DNA back to the Dominican Republic. And so, yes, I can be traced back to Spain, to Portugal, and definitely West Africa is my is the biggest percentage. So yeah, that's my black card. And so I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Wow, that is int- that is really interesting. I'm glad that you shared those percentages with us. I would have never thought that. Anna? Yeah, I, I love the Ancestry DNA and all of the results that it gives us because it does show how much more similar we can be and how much more of each other we have in, within ourselves, right? So I love that you shared that. I also want to share a fun fact before I get to my question. Renee is also a dancer. She dances salsa and all of the things. <laughs> I'm not as good. I still dance, but Renee is is really good at dancing. (laughs) When you were thinking about that, I was just picturing, oh, let's bust out the music now. 
But you mentioned something, Kathy, about being multiracial and how that has changed some of the experience. And according to the Mental Health America and research that has been conducted, multiracial individuals' experiences are very unique. That when talking with others, multiracial people can feel disjointed and there can be a failure to connect. For multiracial people, imposter syndrome goes even deeper than our ability to compete with others in skills or knowledge. It can affect our culture and ethnic identity. When you don't feel like you belong to a group of people, it can make you question even your experiences, your sense of identity, especially when when you identify is often rooted, how you identify is often rooted in the way the world sees you, right? So... When we talk about all that, how have you leveraged your diversity to continue advancing? And do you think employers have made strides in reducing some of those associated to that that identity that everybody else sees you as? Yeah, that is a really good positive question, right? Because oftentimes we're asked about our diversity and the challenges that we face, like we just discussed. But there are also some good positive attributes that allow our diversity to advance, right? My parents were very purposeful when they named me Catherine Elizabeth, and my maiden name was Reynoso. So I couldn't get away from that, right? But because I am first generation American, they were very purposeful in naming me Catherine Elizabeth because it was a very English, Anglo-Saxon name, right? And so for that purpose on job applications and so forth, and at one point in my career, I was modeling. So in casting calls, just when you see the name, you don't know what you're going to get, right? Now, when I got married and took on the name White, now that has really thrown this for a loop because most people that I know that did not know me when I was single don't even realize that I'm Latina, right? And so like I mentioned, passing, I call it, passing, right? So as passing as black, because that is what I appear simply black when I show up and to the rest of the world, right? In that sense, that's the way the world sees me. And so I would say that one of the advantages would be that, right? So the Latino doesn't show up, just the Catherine White shows up. And so that is somewhat of an advantage if you have an employer that is has some kind of aversion to Latinos, which there are many, right? And then also I would say that another advantage would be when I am in customer service environment. So in my in my career, we deal a lot with the customers, right? So that could definitely work to my favor when you have a client that is not versed in the English language. And so I realize that they're struggling even to communicate with me. Once I speak to them in Spanish, you get like a whole change to the conversation, right? It becomes, they become more comfortable. You're now their trusted advisor. And so also when I'm speaking Spanish and the conversation's going in the negative direction, if I'm on the phone with a a customer service and there's something wrong with my bill, right? Just... (laughs) And I realize the person might speak Spanish, then perhaps I may I may flip the switch and now talk to them in Spanish again to use that to my advantage in a sense. And I don't see anything the matter with it. These are all parts of who I am. It's just a matter of how the person on the other side is receiving my authentic self, right? Oftentimes it is a surprise. I had a, a recent situation where I signed up, I got a phone call about a job and the administrative assistant called me before she scheduled the interview. And she says, I just wanted to make sure you realize that this position was for a bilingual speaking person. And I said, (laughs) and it's so funny because I realized that her last name when she introduces herself at the top of the call was a Spanish last name, right? And so when I responded to her, when she asked me that question in English and I responded in Spanish, she's like, oh, my God. OK, Senora White. Oh, perdón. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so that was the answer to her question. Right. I kind of had to once again prove myself. And then I guess the second part of your question, Anna, was regarding employers and how can they reduce discrimination or how do we feel that they're doing in that area? I feel like there have been strives to improve. However, there's just so much work to be done. I feel that we have to navigate the 
the the workplace as females, right? We are all females here, right? So we have that box. I myself, and, and some of you have Latina, so we check that box. And then to check also Black, in my case, and and yours, Renee, right? And then to check first generation. So there's all of these strikes, quote unquote, that are technically against me when it comes to the workplace environment. So often find I find myself, oftentimes I find myself burnt out. There's so many microaggressions and that term, in fact, let's go there. That term <laughs> I mean, I I cannot stand it, right? But I'm saying it in the form so that our listeners and you here can understand where I'm coming from. But just to to label something that is micro, right? A minor aggression, there's no such thing. All aggressions are macro, right? And and they're full of trauma and experiences for the individual that most of the employers have no idea. Right or or they do and they ignore those some of some of our background history right and so I think that to prevent some of the workplace discrimination because for people like me we're consistently how should I say code switching right not on purpose but it's just how we're made up right depending on our environment and and so all the time. We're either trying to normalize maybe our hair, not wear it naturally. We straighten it. I remember in high school, I used to wear hair extensions. At some point in high school, I had, right, Renee? At some point in high school, I had colored contacts. And and now I think about these things and I laugh and I was like, oh my gosh, right? But we didn't know any better. We were just trying to fit in in this in this big America. And so I always laugh and say that from nine to five, I'm corporate. And then at 501, now that we work from home, at 501, I step away from my computer and I'm all the way la bandera, what we call la bandera, which is arroba bichuela y carne, right? So the red... <laughs> <laughs> the red is for red beans, the the white is for the white rice, and the blue is for meat. So any kind of pork, chicken, beef, right? So to us, Dominicans, la bandera really means our flag, which is our culture, which is our staple foods. It's all of that. But yeah, growing up, my mother was definitely like, in la casa hablamos español. At home, we speak Spanish. I don't know what you do out there. <laughs> But that is what we do. And so I, I raised my kids that way in order to be immersed in both languages yeah. and culture. I love that. I have a follow-up question to, to this one, because when we were talking about employers and how they can make strides to reduce discrimination, do you think maybe it's been harder to reduce discrimination against Latinos because we are not all alike? I mean, we have the blondes and blue eyes. We have the Afro-Latinos. We have the, the brown Latinos. We have the more indigenous Latinos. I mean, we, I mean, look at Lolly. Lolly can come to where I live and she is greeted just like another Indian, Hindi Indian, and always welcome. And everybody go approaches her like she's part of the community of the Indian community. Whereas if I go, it's, it's a little bit different. So I, my dad is white and blue eyes. So we used to always get the, I didn't know your dad was white. I'm like, he's not, he's Mexican. <laughs> But do you think that adds to the difficulty that employers and organizations as a whole, the community as a whole, to being able to address the discrimination against Latinos? Absolutely. I think that the fact that we're so diverse is very difficult for them to understand, right? How can you be one and the other and then both? It it just doesn't make sense to them. And so I think that there were many promises that employers made in the year 2000 when we had this cultural awareness, right, with police brutality and all of the indifferences. And for us, we've lived it for centuries, right? So we're, we're looking at employers like, what do you mean you didn't know? So what do you mean you didn't know we come in all shapes and sizes and we're discriminated every day on a daily basis? And so it's it's very difficult for them. And I, I think they have many, many more strives to do in that area in implementing changes specifically in their hiring processes, right? In their promotion processes. How do you get to that next level? And also when it comes to pay, 
there's so many disparities, disparities there. Like I said, we check many, many boxes, female and so on and so on. And we're just not there. Employers are just not there. There's more to be done. And we need to hold them accountable for those things that they have promised us. Yeah, I'd like to kind of speak to that. The employers think that the diversity itself, when the George Floyd thing happened, when he passed, right? And everybody was like, oh, we need to hire a chief diversity officer, right? I saw that flooding every social media platform, recruiting, all of that, right? And, but what I did see as well is there was good intentions, but you can't just kind of check the box and not delve a little bit deeper. And as far as people of color, especially women of color, and that could be Latino, it could be African-American as I am, you have to have representation in certain, at certain levels. You have to have that representation because if you don't, you don't have kind of like a sponsor to be able to speak up when they're talking about certain topics and trying to attract certain ethnicities to that company. I don't care what type of strategy that you have. If you, if you are not like, I could, I'm not Latino, right? So how could I, I can understand the culture to a certain extent, but I don't live the culture, right? I have my own personal experiences as a black woman that maybe you may not understand fully. So when I come to the table and they're talking about certain topics and how would you attract African-American women, I could tell you, <laughs> I mean, I could share my own experiences and the same with you. But unfortunately, I think companies have to do a lot more in order to promote women of color, period, or just people of color into those positions. And that would definitely help. But how do we break through that ceiling? Some companies have done really well, but I don't think it has really trickled down in the way that it should. What do you guys think about that? I, I would definitely agree with that. And I do think a lot of it is just having an open mind. Because when I have spoken to HR leaders in different industries, so this is not a one and done kind of thing in different industries, I understand that there might be a level of empathy, but a level of understanding is still lacking. However, I would like to see work being done to get to that understanding. There are programs and investments that can be made, in my opinion, that mm -hmm. would open up that visibility to others. I know when I was working, I sat with a number of senior VPs that requested time with me just to educate them on how to address the Latino employees. And that was on their own. That was independent of anything because they weren't getting that training. So I think it's something that needs to be done proactively versus reactively, which is what I'm seeing the majority of HR do across the board is a lot of this is reactive to what's the social climate is happening out there with, with the problems that are being more visible and gaining visibility. My thing is you've had how many years to do this? <laughs> we're we're, we're kind of we're behind here. So I remember a question that was asked when it came to comparing Blacks and Latinos. And they said, well, do you think that a lot of Latinos are still misinterpreted or mis misapproached at an event or somewhere as the help? We've heard of when a Black individual is there and their approach is the help. And, and then they correct it. And then the response to that question, I was like, wow. They're like, well, the problem is we are still the help. Mm. It's not that there's been much advancement. So I think that there's, there's a, I mean, when we say there's a lot of work to do, there's a lot of work to do. We have, we're behind about 150 years on the work that needs to be done. I mean, especially in some, some parts of the country that were originally Latin American territory, where the populations and the influence there is highly Latino and we still can't learn from where we live. That's just mind boggling to me. Yeah. yeah. Just to add a little bit to that, what you were saying, where the problem is the Latinas are still in those positions, right? That we are the help. Well, from an African-American standpoint, we say, well, we're not doing those jobs because mm -hmm. the Latinos are now doing those jobs. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So it's kind mm -hmm. of shifted, even though we're still in some of those roles. But we look at, hey, we've done our share. 
we're not doing that anymore. It's your turn. And that's, at least that's my perspective as a black woman and what I've in my circles and things that I have heard from other black people. So isn't that Mm -hmm. interesting? Yeah, I think that's completely interesting. And what I think that in situations where we're not the help, sometimes we're stuck in that mind frame because I find myself sometimes asking, oh, well, would you like some water? And then I have to have to back step and purposely say, I'm not here for that, right? So when I'm, I remember being in a situation where I'm in a boardroom and the, the IT equipment wasn't working correctly, right? And so there were two individuals that looked in my direction as if I was supposed to c- fix. And, and so it, to me, it's, it's mind boggling, right? But I, I think that we have to kind of take a stand, as you said, Renee, and say, hey, I'm not here for that. Right. And oftentimes when we think we are or we're the less senior person in the room and we're asked for our opinion, because I, I there was another situation where I was invited to a meeting and I thought I was just going to take notes. Right. Because I was like, there's no way I'm going to sit in this room of, of chiefs of C-suite. Right. What am I doing here? But that's that imposter syndrome kicking in. Right. And so when I was asked to participate in the conversation, I was like, oh, OK, I had to make up something really quick. So that so that they would understand that that's what I'm there for to be part of the table, and they were they were willing to include me, but I wasn't ready. So we have to make sure that we show up. We have the questions in advance written down or the topics. So when that we're given that opportunity or we take that opportunity, we're ready, set, go. Exactly. I love what you said, and I have I do always tell my friends now, oh, girl, don't go cleaning. That's not your job because <laughs> we do. Have- that innate want to go and fix it, whether it's the motherly one or whatever, we always want to go do the things. And I do always tell my girlfriends, that's not what you're here for. Go put that, put that down. That's not what we're going to do today. So I hear you and I feel you because I have had to stop individuals. I'm like, nope, we're not doing that. You're not going to do that. Not today. (laughs) Not today. Right. I think that the key piece that you mentioned about being ready with your voice is is imperative, right? We have to be prepared. We have to walk in proud into the room and not be willing to take a second step back, right? You're you're there and you should be prepared for whatever it takes for you to continue to be seen in that light. You said something earlier about the switch and it was something I so resonate, right? I I, I grew up bilingual as well and, and it's funny because if I know that you speak English my switch immediately says you and I are going to speak English. If I know that your preference is to speak Spanish, I will speak Spanish, although my Spanish isn't as good as it could be because I just don't practice it as much, right? But it's funny because it is such a switch in your mind that you have to go back and forth. Now, one thing that I I learned a few years back that I thought was very provoking was instead of seeing each other as half Mexican or half Dominican Republican and half black or whatever the percentages are now that you've done your your 23 and me is that the reality is that we have been we are the fortunate ones because we have a dual culture a dual background anytime somebody tells me so sorry because I have such a heavy accent I'm like oh don't apologize for that mm-hmm. way exciting that you can speak two languages even if it's not perfect you still have an advantage over most but we need to stop taking that that as a as a bad thing and 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 claiming it as an advantage right but there's a saying in spanish catherine ni de aquí ni de allá neither from here nor from there what can we as a society do better to remove those mindsets Yeah. So we hear that saying so often, right? And for many different reasons, right? But in this case that we're speaking about today, for me, it's similar to saying, I see no color, right? I mean, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing, right? We can have a whole conversation about that, right? So so for folks to say, it's kind of like, okay, well, you're not from either place. So what are you, right? Or, or, I don't, I don't see you as this or that. I don't see color at all, right? I, I love everybody. Everybody's the same. And, and for a long time, I think we were complacent with that mindset. But nowadays, that doesn't work. Like, if you don't, if you don't see me for what I am, 
then you don't see my struggles. You don't see my, you don't see the microaggressions, quote unquote. You don't see any of this. It's all good in the neighborhood. Well, it's not. And, and, and here's why. And if you're not open to hearing that conversation and having those tough discussions, then we have a problem, right? Because until you're uncomfortable, until we're getting to those topics, then we can't get to the root, right? We, we got to do a root cause analysis here, right? And, and that means that you have to see me for who I am. Yeah, I would agree with that, Catherine, because we were in my house, household, when I was growing up, we were taught, we don't see color. We take people at face value, but you do see color. I want people to see color, right? Because like you said, if you don't see color, you don't see me. (laughs) And my color is part of me. It sure is. So I can't hide it. I can't do anything like that. So, I mean, I'm a black woman. You need to see a black woman. Those the struggles that black women go through. You're a Latina woman. You need to see that, like you said, because there are just things that are inherent to our color, our skin yeah. color, period. We walk in a room and it doesn't matter who's in that room, really, unless it's like your family or something. But I'm talking professionally. When we walk into a room or even into a store, OK, when we walk into a store, they're coming right over to us. Can I help you? And I always take it as, no, (laughs) I do. You're not coming over here to really ask me. You're really not. Because I literally just crossed the threshold. Your customer service ain't that good. (laughs) You ain't that good. So I immediately address it. And I was like, no, when I need you, I will come get you. I do. I say that too, because I feel it. I'm a feeler. And I just feel like, oh, they're getting ready to come over and monitor me. So I'm going to nip it in the bud immediately. (laughs) That's just how I deal with it. How about you guys? I want you to see my color. I don't want you to use it against me. I absolutely agree. I I agree. I, I don't understand that. Like at the stores, I have had my pretty woman moment. I have purposely purchased a whole lot whenever I knew they were on commission from anyone but them. I remember buying my daughter's earrings and the lady was completely disregarding me. And I was so happy because it was my first baby. And I remember when it was time to ring me up and she saw everything I was purchasing. She was like, oh, I said, "Mm -mm, not you. You get commissioned, don't you? She goes, yes. I said, well, then you're not ringing me up. He is. And I picked the only other person of color in that entire store (laughs) to ring me up. And I have done it at Nordstrom when I bought 30 pairs of shoes in one visit. I'm a shoe addict. Me too. Look away when Anna's coming to a shoe store. (laughs) And I walked out like this and I went to that woman and I said, wish you had rung me up, huh? (laughs) Still have some of those bad boys. (laughs) But no, I agree. I agree. Don't don't use my color against me. Mm -mm. Because it might work against you. (laughs) because you don't know you don't know what circles i walk in you don't know what level i am you have no idea and we don't either so we have to be careful with that so i find myself and i purposely do it when i'm out at like a conference or something like that and like you were saying some of the wait staff i don't care who you are in the wait staff but specifically with minority wait staff i go out of my way to say hello Good morning. I was just at one a couple days ago and the guy was standing there and I said hi to him. He didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. So I come back around. I'm like, good morning. How are you? And he's looking at me like, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to speak. (laughs) The third time. (laughs) I'm good. How are you? I don't think he was sure if he was supposed to talk to me. Right. I took a selfie with, with the African-American guy pouring me water. I'm like, hey, let's take a selfie. He looked at me like, really? yeah. So he was like, cool. I mean, his pose was hilarious. <laughs> He's like, I've never had anybody attending something like this to ask me to take a selfie. He's like, you made my day. That is awesome. <laughs> and see, that's the thing. You don't ever know whose day you might make, right? You may have been the only person that spoke to him like he said, in his entire career, 
and, and that accepted him for who he was. And, and I guess at first he had to understand, is she kidding me? Like, does she want me to take her picture with of her of her picture with someone else? <laughs> it was hilarious. Love it. Oh my goodness. Love it. Great reminder. Great reminder. I remember everybody always says, Well, how come the the custodians are always so good to you? All the janitors always do whatever you ask them to do. And I'm like, I invite them to everything I have. I always feed them and I talk to them like they're my friends, not like they work for me. So exactly. mm-hmm. great point, Renee. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yes. cause you just never know. They're just they're saying, I've heard somebody say, I, I think T.D. Jake says this. He goes, I always watch anybody that I'm with. I always watch how they treat the wait staff or yes. cleaning staff. I always watch mm. that because I, I now know that they only treat me the, because I'm at my level because they want something. Mm. Not because they're, they're nice people. You should treat everybody with respect and dignity because like he said, his father has a cleaning business. That's how they, that's how they ate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's how they paid their bills. Mm-hmm. He had a cleaning business. Mm-hmm. So you just never know. And tipping to that point, like, like commission is so important, right? It, for the wait staff, for your housekeeper when you stay in a hotel, et cetera. And it's because these are these people's livelihoods, right? And, and if we don't invest in them, then, then who is? Just like we were talking earlier about how can we lift one another up? How do we keep those promotions happening? Well, when, when we get to a certain level, we need to make sure that we're pulling people up with us instead of slamming that door, that ladder, kicking it. We, we need to make sure that we're propelling, moving the culture forward. Absolutely. And speaking of culture, I ran across this documentary and it shows on the Brio. I guess it's a new channel or station. And there's a senior correspondent named Natasha S. Alford. She travels to, Lo- I think it's Loiza, Puerto Rico. And she, it's during summer of political unrest when protesters ousted their governor. And so through interviews with local residents and scholars and historians, she tells the story of their Afro-Latinx revolution. And it's a really interesting documentary. And I'm going to post it in our show notes for our listeners so that they can go take a look at it. But the key takeaways were there's many shades of blackness, as we know, and we kind of talked about that, right? And that specifically reside in Puerto Rico. And like Afro-Latinos, they must love themselves, we all must love ourselves and accept our African roots. I mean, because that's what it is, right? And to directly challenge anti-Blackness, because if we don't accept ourselves, who else is going to accept us, right? And there are two other takeaways that she was saying that today activists encourage Puerto Ricans with visible Black heritage to write in Black or afro diente. I hope I said that right, on the census, okay? Because some people were not because they're trying to fit in. And the other thing was by claiming and counting black populations, they were hoping to usher in a change for a new era. So just accepting that blackness is key to maintaining some of those cultures. What do you guys think? I love that. I had not heard of that show or anything, but now I'm going to go look at the link. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You know, Renee, I was going to add that we, we've talked a lot in the past about authenticity and really in being able to be authentic, we have to accept who we are. We have to be able to be proud of every piece of whatever percentage we are of whatever. And, and, and when you can come in and demonstrate that you are proud of who you are, you take away the power from other people to use it against you. And yes. I, that, that's what that basically, I think that that's key. The other thing I think is important is this. I hope that they continue to update the surveys as to what race or what color or whatever. I, I, I really find myself struggling with this a lot more, right? Because it, I don't see myself as white. I, I, that's usually you say, they'll say, or other Latino. Well, I tend to, I, I am, Native American and I'm Latino. So you, they don't have that combination in the thing. And I think that we need to stop assuming that we're going to fit into a box of any type. It should be multiple choice because that's the reality of the world today. Yeah, absolutely. 
And even as you were saying, Renee, in this article, in this documentary, they're, they're encouraging the Puerto Ricans that, that are of African descendants to write in Afro descendant in, I guess, in their census, right? Yeah. And, and it's mm-hmm. because it doesn't exist. So they have to write it in. So it's that other category, right? Because mm-hmm. when the numbers come out, it makes it seem as the island is mostly white, but that's simply because the correct categories weren't that's there right. to identify with. And so they're trying to get that census to look like be a representation of what the island really is like. And that's so often the case, specifically with employers or any applications that you fill out when they ask you. And then it'll have a small note where it says, mm-hmm. if you're Hispanic, then you have to choose Hispanic. Whether you're you're a white Hispanic or a black Hispanic, you choose his that, that should be the only category that you can pick. Mm-hmm. So I'm always baffled when there's that side asterisk just for us and they they want to categorize us for something that we may or may not be. I don't know if you noticed in in the internal applications that you filled out, we did get that removed from my previous employer where it said, except Latino, except Hispanic or Latino, except because every category said white except Hispanic or Latino Black, except Hispanic yep. or Latino Asian, except his- so exactly. we did get that removed internally there, but I think there's still a lot of work to go. Uh, I always remember growing up, and the only box that I was allowed to check, the teachers would guide you, was white, and I would always say, but I'm not white. My birth certificate says I'm white, but I'm not white, and it's like, of course, those are the things that I didn't learn until later because when you're told something and that's all you've ever known it's like okay well no that's what I'm supposed to check right and when you start to really not so much find yourself but find your culture within yourself you're like I don't feel happy checking that box anymore I want to check all the other boxes and and I think it's very important to have that option why should you put me in a box I'm not one one of those things And as the world continues to evolve, look at how many more multiracial individuals are walking around today than there's anything else. I mean, I can guarantee you, even a person that thinks their blood is only of one thing, it's not. My DNA, my ancestry DNA shows I have 8% of African descent. So we all are descendants of Africa, according to historical diaries. We all have that. We all have that percentage in there. So stop putting anyone in a box for that matter. Yeah. Great Uh, insights. Thank you for bringing those statistics up, Renee. Yeah. And I I have some more statistics that I want to say, but I want to talk about one thing because we're all women here and it could be as you were growing up or even in corporate America, talking about our looks, right? Just the way we wear our hair, the way our styles, right, can be very different. Makeup can be very different culturally, right? And I just, I just find it very, very interesting. And I know I've, I have experienced this. When I first started wearing braids in high school, I haven't always, I just, every once in a while, I'll put them in. But it, when I was, a te- I think I was like a teenager or like early 20s. I didn't wear them for a long time after that. But then with COVID, I was like, okay, I'm lazy. (laughs) So they're going in, (laughs) which a lot of African-American women did. (laughs) Preventative hairstyle, right? But I noticed that people always wanted to try and touch my hair. And that's one thing you don't do with Black women. You don't touch their hair. So that's like a serious thing. You do not touch their hair. And because they, our hair is a culture in itself. I believe Tracy Ross, she did a documentary on black hair, period. And there's been others. I think Chris Rock did something Mm -hmm. and a couple others. So it's a big thing. But I always found it interesting that people wanted to touch my hair because they were like, oh, it looks different. And yes, it's a different regimen, right? Just like every, I see you three. Your hair is different. <laughs> You're different from mine, but it's still different. All three, I see it. And even if Carla was here, I would see the textures are different because you're from different areas. Have you guys ever experienced anything like that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
with me, if you, I'm the black sheep of my family, right? So <laughs> if you look at any one of my siblings, they all have, even my daughters have really long, thick hair. I mean, it's, it's, it's gorgeous and, and a lot, right? Whereas me, my hair is a lot more coarse. It's shorter. And as the years go by, I cut it shorter and shorter and shorter. <laughs> it's more manageable. But to your point, I mean, hair is a whole thing. And especially when COVID hit, because then the salons were closed. And that was like, what? I mean, because we're used to going to the salon on a regular basis, whether whether it's to get our hair relaxed, whether it's to get it colored, whether it's to get it braided, twist, you call it, right? Extensions, weaves, wigs, all of it. And so when we were put in a position where that wasn't an option and now we had to figure out how to maneuver, maneuver with it ourselves, a lot of us just went natural again, right? Yes, that's, mm -hmm. But then you go natural and what happens when you have that Zoom call? <laughs> Right? <laughs> what happened to you? <laughs> what happens? Because that happened to me. And 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 my coworkers were just like, huh? And, and it was the funniest thing because I was spectacle like, okay, I how should I wear my hair? Should I go wrap it really quick? And I'm like, no, I can't show up in a headscarf. But that it 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 brings a whole new meaning to your authentic self, right? And so people just need to learn to accept you for how you are, who you are. And it, we like to wear our hair differently. And, and that may be a culture shock to some people. But I think the more that we show that part of us, right? Because we don't just wake up like this. We're not all Beyonce, right? <laughs> you don't wake so, up like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so people That's just cool. need to accept... <laughs> I love it. I know we're almost yeah. Nice, but I I do want to add COVID was even an awakening for many. I didn't realize a lot of Latinos have curly hair and they've always hidden it. I didn't know that. I was like, what? What about your curly hair? I used to pay to get my perms. I love curly hair. I didn't realize that that was also a stigma. Again, I was like, how those little posts you were how old when you realized? <laughs> <laughs> that was me with the curly hair. So I, I've always had straight hair. Blame it on my indigenous roots. I know Lolly has straight hair. I mean, I literally just wash my hair and do nothing with it. I didn't realize that work that went into assimilating, the work that went into being part of. So when Renee mentioned that right now, COVID, I was like, yep, that's when I woke up and realized these things. But very interesting indeed, because I personally love curly hair. I remember paying for it to be, my mom has her hair permed right now in this day and age. You know what I mean, so it's just very odd that people are judged by their hair, their hair texture, their hair color, their hair, the way it looks. I mean, does that really impact how I work? Cause I don't, I don't, I don't believe it. Yeah. It's a thing. It's like, oh, do you have good hair or do you have the bad hair? Right. That's what it is. From African-American standpoint, you got good hair. hair. The bed here. <laughs> Especially if you are biracial, because a lot of my nieces and nephews are biracial. So I have like 28 of them and probably about maybe 20 of them are biracial, being Caucasian and black. And some of them have good hair. Some of them have the not so good hair. And you can see like the siblings, especially the girls, not so much the boys, but the girls where the girls with the good hair, they were able to fit in a little bit and assimilate a little quicker. And there, you could see there was some jealousy there. Mm. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. And, and yeah. it's like that even within our Latino culture, right? E even within us, there's, there's definitely colorism. Oh, yeah. So it, it's not just a, a Black thing. It's also in other ethnicities as well. And depending on your skin tone, your and and again, your hair texture is how you're treated. And that just goes back to slavery. Were you a field yep. slave or a house slave, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Yep. Because you're lighter skin, you're going to be in the house. Exactly. Right? We're going to have to do a whole other episode on that I one. Know, right? Colorism is another topic that's mind-boggling to me. 
<laughs> Why? Yeah, it's, just, it's interesting. But let me just give you some of these statistics because I just thought this was quite interesting. According to Princeton University's Project on Ethnicity and Race in Latin America, nearly a quarter of the Hispanic population in the region are of African descent. But the misconception of what a proper Latino physically looks like is the root of the controversy. So in the U.S., there's about one-sixth of the Afro-Latino population that does not identify as Hispanic, right? So skin color is a major factor. I've got also, when asked directly about their race, only 18% of Afro-Latinos identified their race or one of their races as Black. That's only 18%. Mm. In fact, 39% of Afro-Latinos identified as white alone or white in combination with another race. 24% volunteered that their race or one of their races was Hispanic and only 9% identified as mixed race. What do you guys think of those? I mean, that's quite interesting to me. Very interesting. And I think that's why that study is asking us to fix that and correct that so that we can be properly identified because it, it might also show good numbers. It will show numbers of where we are actually in places we don't believe we are in today. So I think these numbers speak volumes and we need to probably do something about it. Yeah. 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 And it's all about the mindset and, and how you were raised, right? So if you yes. were raised that that you are white, even though you were born in, in South American country, right? But that's all right, because Afro-Latino, Afro-Latino X is really more commonly used here in the States, right? But if you go to our, our native countries, you're just Colombian, right? It's in the on At the country, in country, I should say in country, they only identify as a native of that country. But then you migrate to the U.S. and now you're being asked, well, are you Afro or are you, oh. right? And, and so that causes confusion depending on where you're from and how you were raised. So yeah, it's very difficult when you ask folks to identify themselves if the terminology is not native to them. Absolutely. So in summary, the multiple dimensions of Afro-Latino identity reflects the long colonial history of Latin America, during which mixing occurred among indigenous Americans, white Europeans, and slaves from Africa and Asia. Thank you once again to our guest, Kathy Weish, and all our listeners for joining the pod crew today. Black history includes a very diverse population that continues to the fight to reclaim their history and lead a struggle for justice despite years of erasure. I'd like to leave you with a quote from Calvin Pearson, Project 1619 founder. Transatlantic slave trade just like the systematic elimination of the Native American Indians in the United States and the Holocaust in Germany are human tragedies that change the world. We cannot change history or the impact that it has had in our past generations, but we should always recognize and learn from the perils and transgressions of mankind's inhumanities against one another. With that said, we hope you learned something new or came away with something different of a perspective on this topic. You can follow our guest, Catherine Weish, on LinkedIn, and we'll provide the, the link on the show notes. And as promised, here's how to join us as an audience member on our next show episode. We hope you're just excited as we are. Go to our True Talk Cafe Facebook page and send us a request to attend season two, episode three, as an audience member. Be sure to use the hashtag TTCS2. EP3. Again, hashtag TTCS2EP3. We will respond to your request with our podcast website link where you will need to enter your preferred email address for us to send the audience link to. And then we'll also send all audience members a reminder the day before the show recording. It's going to be so much fun to have you on there with us. So come join us live. As always, we welcome your feedback, so please let us know your thoughts about today's show. Leave a comment or a review. We will respond to all of your comments. Please be nice, though. We are only human, and we, we really are trying to do our best to offer you something that you will enjoy. We'd love to hear your thoughts about today's topic. Please do not forget to like and to rate the episode. We appreciate you tuning in to our podcast, and we hope you'll join the TTC Crew Facebook page. Again, you'll find us on Instagram and Facebook using 
at True Talk Cafe. Please use the hashtag TTC Talks or hashtag True Talks, excuse me, hashtag True Talk Tuesdays. Recommendations for discussion topics are always welcome. So we want to know that we're providing you with content that you find value. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button as well. And thank you so very much for listening to us. And we hope you'll join us on our next podcast episode. It's sure to be an engaging conversation. We talk. look forward to talking to you again soon and happy Valentine's Day. Bye.